Well, thank you for joining us again tonight for Feed Your Faith. I'm sorry I was unable to be with you last week, had a little bit of a medical problem, and uh, ready to go tonight. So let's get after it. Last time we talked a little bit about that matter of feeding our faith and what was necessary to feed our faith and the fact that we do not feed our doubts, but rather we feed our faith. Now, how do we feed that faith? Well, we pointed out several times as we've been involved in this discussion, the faith is that which originates from God's word. That's the point of Romans 10 and then verse 17, when he says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we're going to grow that faith, if that is going to be fed, then it needs to be from the feeding of God's word, that we look into it and study it. We talked about last time, 1 Peter chapter 2, that we look at it as the milk of the word, that we may grow thereby unto salvation. And so as we look at the word of God and grow from that word of God, a new life starts. Well, what is that new life? That new life is the new way that is directed by our faith or by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the very theme statement of the book of Romans. As the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So when we feed our faith, what we're doing is we're looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're making that a part of our life. It no longer is that which just exists in paper and ink. It's that which exists within the heart. Indeed, Paul pointed out in Galatians chapter 2 that Christ lived in him in the life that he now lives. He no longer lived in the flesh, but by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So the word of God is not to just exist in a book that's laid down on a table somewhere. It's to exist in our heart. It's to come into us as we let it change and mold us into what God ought to be. That's the process of how faith works. From faith, the faith of the gospel of Christ, to faith, our faith, the letting of it live in our lives, that's how it is that we grow the faith that is there. And so the idea of growing that faith comes from a centering in of our attention on the Word of God. Well, if our faith comes from, from a centering on the Word of God, where do our doubts come from? Our doubts come from that which is, as we noted, starting out, last time, a couple of weeks ago. They originate from our own selves. You remember we looked at Matthew chapter 14 and the case of Jesus out in the boat. The storm was there. And as that storm was tempestuous, he came to them walking. They were fearful of him, thought he was a ghost. Peter then responds to Jesus. He said, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, as Jesus had pointed out to them it was, Command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. That statement that Jesus made or question, why did you doubt? Why is it? What caused that? Well, we had noted last time why the doubt was there and why the doubt was not there. Their doubt was not a part of God having created that doubt in them. Well, did their doubt come from something that Jesus said? Did it come from a doubt that started with their focus on the power of Christ as he was able to walk on that water for all that time? 
Was it a result of any failure from God? Well, we recognize with all of these, obviously not. Those were not the cause of the doubt. The doubts arose when their thoughts were of themselves, their own origin, and not from God. As Peter looked around, he saw the wind was boisterous. He saw the sea was tempestuous. And as he looked at that, rather than focusing on Jesus, that's when he began to sink. The power was there with Jesus to make him walk upon the water. It was there from the beginning. It was there at the end. He lifted him into the boat. There was no reason to have doubt about Jesus. But Peter's doubt came when he started looking away from Jesus and he started thinking from his own origin. Now, I want to notice a case tonight, if I might, with you with Job. We're not going to go too long on this case, but I want you to think about the case of Job. We all remember Job and who he is. He was one in the Old Testament. The book of Job is thought to record uh, things that took place probably in the time of Abraham or before. Job was a man who had 10 children, seven sons, three daughters. They were ones who were with him. Job was a man who cared for God. He cared for his children. His children's care was more with regard to their spiritual life than what we see of the physical. While they came and ate with him and had feasts, he would give a sacrifice for each one of them. God, he said, perhaps they cursed God in their heart and I didn't know about it. And therefore he was careful for their spiritual health and desired that above all things. Truly a good example for us. But then in one day, as a result of Satan's action, everything changed. Satan came to God and said he was looking at the sons of men. God says, did you consider my son, my child, Job? He said, oh, yes. I've seen Job. You built a hedge around him, and that's why he cannot uh, go away from you. But if you take that hedge away and you take the things from him, then he would curse you and die. So what did God allow Job? God allowed Job, go ahead, test him. You've got it within your power. You can take the things that he has. He did. He took all of the wealth that was there. He took the 10 children of Job. I asked you to think about that. As he took those 10 children of Job, what happened? Well, what Job said at that point was, then Job tore his robe. There was mourning over it and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Imagine, you're a wealthy man. You have children that are there, and they're all taken away. Would it be normal to grieve about that? Surely. It'd be normal to wonder why did this happen? And that's exactly what Job did. But what the scripture tells us in this is that in all this, he did not sin or charge God with wrong. He didn't say it's God's fault. He's the one that did this. Job didn't do that. He retained his faith in God. Now I want you to think about that from the very start. What happens here, there's one thing that changes. The one thing that changes is not something that Job knows as much about as we do in reading the scripture. Because Job was not given from anything we're told in scripture the indication that this was Satan who did this. Job is wondering throughout, how is this right for God to do this? But in that wondering, that doubt, he did not let the doubt conquer. He did not sin before God. He did not call, uh, charge God with wrong. And then Satan moves another step. After he stayed continuously faithful to God, then Satan says to God, ah, 
but you'd, if you'd touch his flesh, then he'd curse you and die. You see, Satan had an idea that he would curse God, that he would reject God if he had all of his possessions and his children gone. That didn't work, but he had another plan. Always be sure that if you don't give in to Satan, Satan has another plan. Always be on your guard. That devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may desire, des devour. And he wanted to devour Job. And he said, if you had let me touch him, I'll make him so sick that he'll deny you. He was allowed to do that, but not to cause him death. And so boils arose all over Job. And as Job had these boils arise, he was taking pieces of pottery that had broken and he was scraping himself. He was so miserable. You ever had chicken pox or something like that? As I remember having chicken pox as a kid, I wanted to scratch everything all over the place. And my mother told me, no, 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 you can't scratch. It'll leave scars if you do that. Well, I didn't know how in the world I could possibly keep from scratching because it itched so much. Surely that's what Job saw with boils all over. And so what happens? What happens is that Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, it said, struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took from him a potsherd, or took for himself a potsherd, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, here's her advice, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Even through all of this suffering, did he doubt what was going on? Yes. Did he wonder why this is fair? The rest of the book affirms that. Yes, he did. He was trying to go through and see if I've sinned, how have I sinned? Reveal it to me, Lord. But what happened to him at this time? His wife, his own wife said, you need to curse God and die. He refused to do so. He held to his integrity. He held to his faith in God. Why? Because he recognized what God had done. You see, he was looking at things that he did not know for sure that God did it. But he looked back upon things where God had communicated with him and God had been good to him. He looked at those facts that were there and he concentrated on them rather than on the doubts that arose from his own thinking. And what happened as a result? He listened to his faith by listening to God and not listening to his doubts. Well, which are we doing? Are we listening to doubt or are we listening to God? You see, the fact was that Job's friends listened to the doubts about Job. Those doubts that arose where they were thinking he might have done this, surely he did because he's suffering so much, but not from facts. They charged him with one thing after another of evil, but they had not one fact to show that. But they let those doubts ride and their own thoughts, their own doubts brought them to make a conclusion that was wrong. During that, what Job did is he asked God why the suffering was taking place. You know, we have doubts that arise in our life. From time to time, they're there. They're going to exist. And what we need to learn is how do I deal with them? We do not deal with our doubts by giving our doubts the same place that we give our faith. Our faith comes from what God says. It is undeniable. It is that which cannot be refuted. It has God as the very basis of that. And the strength and the power and the wisdom of an almighty God is behind his word. He is the one who inspires all of it. 
Second Thess or Second Timothy chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen say. So we can depend upon that word of God to tell us what it is we're to do because that is from God and we can know it. But how about our doubts? Our doubts arise from ourselves. And as our doubts arise from ourselves, Job didn't listen to those to make up his mind what to do. He listened to his faith, to what God had said. Job didn't know what we're told at the start. What comes to be his working theory, if you will, is the same as his three friends, that God somehow was bringing this upon him, but he didn't know what, how and why. He was innocent. It wasn't a charge of sins. If he was a sinner and didn't know it, he asked God to reveal it. But what we know behind the scene is this wasn't coming from God. God had confidence in Job. And the very reason this was happening was not from God, it was from Satan. And God had such confidence in Job, he says, no matter what you do in trying him, Job is a man who will hold fast to his integrity. And he was right about Job. Job's doubts came from not knowing where the suffering originated. And when we think about our doubts and let them predominate, it can sometimes overcome faith. Job didn't let himself do that. The end of the book gives us an exchange between Job and Jehovah. It's found in chapter 38 and following where God asked him, do you know about these various things in the world? Do you know how this world was created? The things that are there, the animate things, the inanimate the earth as it exists, the animals that are there, how they function, how they're interrelated. What is he doing there? What he's doing is pointing Job to the fact that there's order in this world, not just an order that's somewhat orderly. It's an amazing order where everything is interconnected. It goes like clockwork. He talks to him about the bodies of uh, the skies and how they move, how it is that they're ones that you can depend on. The ancients knew that with their sundials and the various things that were there. They could recognize where a star would be or where a planet would be at a given time. They recognized the movements of difference. They looked and they saw the patterns of the earth with regard to its weather and so forth. They looked at animals, saw how they were interrelated and sometimes dependent upon one another. And God says, can you explain that? Job could not explain how that came to be or how it was sustained. And you know, a lot of people today, they understand the working of something, but they cannot tell us how it came to be. How did such power and how did such order come to exist? by a big bang? How many orderly things have you seen come out of an explosion? But the fact is, the extreme order of this earth exists and the power of it, the magnitude. We talk about stars that are light years away. I'm gonna tell you, I don't understand that. You have light that travels, I think it's about 186,000 miles per second. You look at the distance that is in a year, a number too big for me to even think about. And that's a light year. Not even very far, according to their terms. Stars are sometimes multiplied even millions of light years away. I can't understand that kind of distance. But you know what? God can, and to him that's like nothing. I see the power that you have going over every second or every minute over the Niagara Falls, or as you look at things rushing through the Grand Canyon, or you see other things where there's just a magnificence of a display of the power of the natural realm. Who created that? I couldn't. I don't have that kind of power. But God was one who could create that and sustain it because his power is that which is everlasting. It has no limits. So God's asking Job about this. How'd this come to be? What does Job do? He asked him for an answer 
Job can't answer it. But Job's faith grew because he recognized more and more God's divine ability. I want you to think about that. If our faith is going to grow, it's going to go through God's word and an amazement at the power that's seen of an almighty God. I hear sometimes people today talking about miracles are still working. Well, I want you to see something. Where do you find a miracle like you find in the Bible with the kind of power that's there that's still being done today? Those miracles were worked for a reason. Mark 16 points out to us that the reason was that they preached the word, confirming the word by the signs that followed. That was what was necessary for those to go out before we had a Bible that's been assembled and collected for the fullness of revelation that God intended. It was spoken to men. And they would have to ask, well, how do we believe you? Why should we believe that what you're saying is correct? A miracle was worked to confirm that word was indeed from God. You look at what happened. People come out to take Jesus in the garden on the night of his betrayal. An ear is cut off from one of these men who are involved in the murderous mob, Malchus. Jesus stretches forth his hand and the ear comes back. How did that take place? Have you seen something like that happen? Or you have the things that happened in the times of the Old Testament. The idea of the sun being stilled or the sun being backed up on the dial. Have you ever thought about the kind of power that that would cause? And can you explain that in natural terms? How do you stop a body that's moving at the equator about a thousand miles per hour? How do you take that and reverse that and go back opposite that? What happens to the oceans? What happens to everything else? When you have a body in motion, it tends to stay in motion. What happens when you reverse that? You have a big problem. Yet, did you see that in this world? No. Nope. You see exactly the opposite. How do I explain that? I don't. It was a miracle. If I could explain it in natural terms, it would not be a miracle. Miracles were those things that were taking place beyond the natural laws in New Testament times. And they were to demonstrate the power of God. They're not to demonstrate the fact of an order that continues on day to day. That's amazing. That's something that's a testimony that God indeed did create that. But miracles were done where there was no other thing that could be said than that God directly acted in that way. And what did that do? That confirmed what that one was saying was from God. Now here's what Job did. He looks at that and he recognizes through God's power all that's there that in fact God is the one who is behind creation. And what did he learn to think? What he learned to think, no doubt, was the same thing that God told Isaiah. My thoughts are not your way, thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Man, when he looks into the word of God, recognizes the power that's behind that is divine. And that's what moves one to faith as it should be. That growing in faith, that recognition of divine ability behind that is what causes Job to have that greater faith. Now what happens next? There's a conclusion to all of that. It says, then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer yea, twice but I will proceed no further. That point that is there of what he has done is something that shows very clearly that Job is the one who is recognizing that great power and he's continuing to see that. At the very end, in Job chapter 42, that's a wrong statement. Job chapter 42, it ought to be verses one through six. Then Job answered the Lord and said, 
I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now I, my eyes see, my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job 42, one through six. What's the point? The point is that Job recognizes that his faith came from seeing what was there of God. He uses the word hearing and seeing in a way that's there heard comes from somebody else, but he has now the experience of seeing this from God, that God has directly interacted with him and told him how these things are. That's what God does with us through the word of God, through the Bible. And as we look at the gospel, the New Testament revelation, we have that final and complete revelation of God to man that directs us in what we're to do. Now, my question tonight is, which way are we going to handle that? Are we going to concentrate on our faith or our doubts? It's one or the other. Job concentrated on his faith. Why? Because when you think about it, that ought to be more sure than our doubts. The faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It comes from God's word. He's the one who has given his word on that. When you and I read the word of God, we read that which we can have an absolute confidence in. I can't have an absolute confidence in my doubts. Why? They arise from me. They arise from my own thinking about things. So what do we do? Too many times people come along and they start thinking on their own. And they want to call their thinking to be something that God answers. Job asked for that. Job got it. And Job understood the conclusion. He said, it's too wonderful for me. I cannot understand. When you start to question the word of God, take a step back and look in a mirror. Who am I to question God? Who is mortal man that does not know to question the God of heaven, the omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing God? I am nothing in comparison to God. And so what do we do? We learn to feed our faith. That's the strongest thing we have because it is founded upon the power of an almighty, all-knowing God. When you start to doubt about things and your doubts are there and you're like Peter sinking in the sea because the doubts are what you've concentrated on, come back and concentrate on the solid foundation of God's Word. Come back and reach out to the hand of God that teaches us through His will all things that we need to know concerning life and godliness. In doing that, then our faith can predominate and we can look on God's word and depend upon it and come to accept it in all things and recognize no matter what, God is always right and will always be with him. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be here again, Lord willing, next Monday night at seven o'clock. We'll be starting our church history classes probably in September uh, on the Thursday nights at seven o'clock. So keep ready to join us for those as well. Until then, thank you for joining us tonight. May God bless you. Good night.